Today I want to look at this viral math question that's been going around social media regarding square roots and negative numbers. And while the question seems to give some sort of contradiction in, well, the value of these square roots. So anyway, let's look at one of these types of questions. So let's say we were to calculate the square root of negative four times the square root of negative nine. So on the one hand, we know the following rule. We know that the square root of x times the square root of y is equal to the square root of x times y. So that's something that you probably learn like in an Algebra 2 class or maybe even an Algebra 1 class in high school. So that means we should be able to smash these square roots together to give us the square root of negative 4 times negative 9. In other words, the square root of 36, which is 6. Notice the two minus signs under the radical simplify. But in fact, we could use this rule in reverse, keeping in mind that negative 4 is negative 1 times 4 and negative 9 is negative 1 times 9 to do the following. So we can take this and write it as negative 1 times the square root of 4. I should say the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 9. But after that, we can take these two square roots of minus 1, which of course we might write as i. It's kind of standard to write the square root of minus 1 as i. And we could multiply these two together to give us negative 1. And we could, like, in parallel, multiply these two together to give us the square root of well, let's see, 4 times 9, which is 36. So doing that, we should get negative 6 because it's negative square root of 36. But now let's see what we've done here. We've created this big string of equations that seems to say that negative 6 is equal to 6. And the question here is which of these calculation techniques is correct and what's the real final value? Well, unfortunately, I'm going to say that they're both correct and both are the real final value. But let me explain. So what's the situation here? Well, in fact, over the complex numbers, there's this notion of a multi-valued function. And this idea can be made fairly rigorous, or I should say very rigorous, several different ways. I think the most popular way in modern textbooks is with the notion of a Riemann surface you cut the complex plane along some axis, fold it up a little bit, and then glue copies of it together. We'll maybe briefly talk about what that means for the square root function at the end. So some examples of these multi-valued functions are the square root of z, the cube root of z, the fourth root of z, and so on and so forth. Also a logarithm of z, or an inverse tangent of z, or in fact, any inverse trig function of z. I think you can perhaps see a pattern here, and that is that often multi-valued functions are inverses of well-known functions. Like the square root of z is the inverse of the squaring function, the cube root the inverse of the cubing function, the log of z the inverse of the exponential function, and so on and so forth. So those uh, tend to be the multi-valued functions. Okay, well, what does this mean for us? Well, I'd like to recall the famous Euler's formula, and that uh, involves exponentials and imaginary powers. So if we've got e to the i theta, we can write that as, well, let's see, it's cos theta plus i times sine theta. And then if we go down here to the complex plane, keeping in mind that we generally take the real axis to be the horizontal axis and the imaginary axis, which is simply i times a real number to be the vertical axis, then what we've got going on here is something like this. So we've got a point out here and perhaps this thing right here is a distance r from the origin, and then this is an angle theta. And then, well, note that if we push this down to this axis, we'll get r times cosine theta. And if we push it over to the 
vertical axis, we get i times r times sine theta. So in fact, what we see here is this nice polar form of a complex number. Notice this number z, perhaps we would call this number right here z, is equal to r times e to the i theta. That's a polar representation here. But now I'd like to make the following observation, which should be kind of familiar from trig class, and it's based off the fact that cosine and sine are two pi periodic. So let's observe that if we take e to the i theta, and then we add two times pi, we get the same thing as e to the i theta, not plus anything. And that's because cosine of theta plus two pi is the same thing as cosine of theta, and the same thing for sine. They're two pi periodic. Okay, but now let's observe that that means that we have two expressions for z. We actually, in fact, have infinitely many expressions for z, but we're just going to look at these two expressions. So this is also equal to e to the i theta plus 2 times n times pi, where n is equal to 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2, and so on and so forth. It's any integer. Now if we write z in polar form as r e to the i theta, well then notice that it can also be expressed in polar form as r times e to the i theta plus 2 pi, or really plus 4 pi, minus 2 pi, minus 6 pi, minus 4 pi, so on and so forth. But we're just going to need these two for our purposes. Okay, but now let's observe the following. We can take the square root of z reasonably two different ways. So we could take it with our first expression right here, which I'll underline in green. Then maybe I'll just say that that's what we're doing in this first one. And that's going to give us the following. We'll have the square root of r times e to the i theta over 2. Observe that that's going to half the angle right here, so we're going to be about right here in terms of our angle. But then we could also use this second expression, and let's see. That will be for this uh, second calculation, and that's going to give us the square root of r times e to the i, let's see, it's going to be theta over 2, and then plus pi. But now, we can rewrite that a little bit. That's simply going to be the square root of r, and then e to the i theta over 2, times e to the i pi. But now, let's notice what we have here. We have this second calculation is uh, involves a term that comes straight up out of our first calculation and then a second term, this e to the i pi. But that e to the i pi, in fact, well, that's famously minus 1 due to Euler. So we could rewrite this as negative square root of r times e to the i theta over 2. So reasonably, the square root of z could be either this number or negative this number. Maybe we could summarize this over here. In our setting, we have the square root of z is equal to the following. It's either r, square root of r e to the i theta over 2 or negative square root of i e to the i theta over 2. And you might say, well, we didn't scale this any further using the periodicity, but you would get the same thing over and over again. I'll leave that as a bit of a homework exercise. And this is the multi-valuedness of the square root function. And this is something you wouldn't see in normal calculations, calculations outside of the real numbers. And that's what's interesting about this viral problem, is it exploits the multi-valuedness of the square root function over the complex numbers in order to create something that seems like a contradiction. Okay, well, let's maybe finish this video off by looking back at the original problem now that we know something about the multivaluedness of the square root function. So now we're back to our original question. Square root of minus 4 times square root of minus 9. So let's take this first one and write it kind of in this goofy way. We'll have the square root of 4 times e to the i and then it's going to be pi plus, let's say, 2 times n times pi. 
And then notice that n can be equal to zero or one. And I'll just say, well, you don't need any other values of n to explore this problem to its fullest. And let's do the same thing for negative nine. So we'll have the square root of nine and then e to the i pi plus two times m times pi. So again, we'll take m to be either equal to zero or one. And again, because any other value is not required to explore this problem to its fullest. Okay, so now we can write this as the square root of 36, combining the four and the nine together. And then let's see, since we're taking the square root, we have to half the exponent. So that's gonna be e to the i pi over two plus n times pi. So that's halving the exponent. Then the same thing over here. So e to the i pi over two plus m times pi. Okay, great. But now observe that that's gonna simplify to six times e to the i pi plus m pi plus n pi after putting it all together. But now observe that m and n can be either both zero, one of them is zero and one of them is one, or they're both one. So let's see what we get for each of those values. So let's see, if m and n are zero, then this is gonna turn into six times e to the i pi, but that's equal to negative six. So that's if m equals n equals zero. So that was definitely one of the possibilities we saw at the beginning. If m is one, and n is zero, then that's gonna turn into six e to the i times two pi. But that's simply equal to six because you can check pretty easily via this formula that e to the i two pi is one. So that's if m equals one and n equals zero, or maybe vice versa. And I'll just put a squiggle there to mean the other possibility that's kind of parallel to that, which is m equals zero and n equals one. But now let's look at the final possibility, which is what happens if they're both one. So we'll get six e to the i three times pi, but notice that three times pi is one and a half times around the circle. That goes back to negative one. So that's gonna give us negative six. And that's if m equals n equals one. But check it out, using this maybe careful way of taking square roots of complex numbers to find all of the potential values of the square root function, we found both of the values that were calculated in our original calculation. Which explains why at the beginning of the video, I said, in fact, both of these values are correct. 